as I was thinking about this next song that we're going to sing, um, the song is The God of Angel Armies, and I get the representation of thinking about all these kings from uh, Old Testament battle times and all of their armies that they had, all these thousands and thousands and thousands of men, and they would come and attack some other army, and they would get defeated over and over again, no matter the number. Some of the numbers were ghastly. There was huge amounts of people that, you know, that they just didn't win, and I'm thinking about this song, and um, God has a God of angel armies, and this God of angel armies never loses. You know, they always win, and um, in the song it says that this army is on our side, so it gives me a lot of confidence to know that we can conquer anything. Amen?
And I love what it portrays. The God of angel armies is on my side. Um, just have a little bit of an exhortation for all of us today. It's one thing to know something, but then it's another to know something that nobody can take away from you. Um, I was just reflecting on what God wanted me to share today. And the verse, um, Psalm 139, 17, talks about how precious God's thoughts are towards us. That how vast the sum of the thoughts that God has towards us. They outnumber the amount of grains of sand on the earth. And so um, I didn't get a chance to get down to the beach, but this little bottle would hold about 1.5 million grains of sand. Something like that would hold 3 to 3.5 million grains of sand. God has that many thoughts towards each of his children. He thinks about me far more than I ever think about him. And um, he wants to speak to me so much more than I even want to hear him. And that's just incredible. So that song about the God of angel armies, he is so powerful, but yet he cares so much to think towards me. So Zephaniah 3.17 says, the Lord your God is in your midst. The mighty one will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. And he will rejoice over you with singing. I, I love singing. I don't know if you guys noticed that. It's kind of what I, what I do. God loves to sing over me. That's awesome. And his melodies are like way better than anything I could ever come up with. Um, and... So knowing that, I'm just kind of setting the stage to talk about what God's really put on my heart, is um, he, want, he wanted me to talk to you guys today a little bit about fear. Fear is defined as an unpleasant emotion caused by the belief that someone or something is dangerous and likely to cause pain or threat. And then slave, so... Fear is one definition. Slave is another. Slave is defined as a person who is excessively dependent upon and strongly influenced or controlled by something. And a lot of the world today, some of us are slaves to fear. We are controlled by fear. Maybe not even, maybe we don't even think that we're controlled by it. We think we're just, we're strongly influenced by it. And we make our decisions because of it. I am not denying that the world is a scary place. It is. Life is scary. There are so many things that cause us to fear. Worry is fear. Obsessing about something is fear. Disguised as concern. Like, oh, I'm just really concerned about that thing. It's okay to, it's it's sometimes healthy to have some fear. But am I believing fear Or am I believing the God of angel armies? That's really what the question is. And as children of God, God's made us his children. When we have surrendered our hearts to him and made Jesus our Lord, we have become his children. We are commanded throughout scripture, don't be afraid. You know, Joshua Joshua 1, 7, don't be afraid, take courage. You know, Jesus said, don't be anxious for anything. Paul says, don't be anxious for anything. We're commanded throughout scripture to not fear. And again, I'm not minimizing what we're facing. A lot of us might be facing some pretty serious things like what is the diagnosis? Or where will we live? Or how can we pay for that? What if I don't survive? All of these things are questions and fears that we live with on a daily basis. Another one is, what if our freedom is stripped from us? That's another big fear right now. And in the face of fear, which is often very real, am I serving God or am I serving fear? Am I believing fear or am I trusting God? Uh, A quote that I I really have been hanging on to lately is called, courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is what happens when fear says its prayers. 
And I'm just going to shift to Peter. Remember when Peter was walking on the water? Does everybody remember that story when Jesus was walking on the water and then Peter gets out and starts walking on the water? Jesus wasn't teaching Peter how to walk on water. Jesus was teaching Peter, look at me. The storm was still raging. It didn't just stop because Peter looked at Jesus. The storm was still all around him. But Jesus kept saying, Peter, look at me. Peter, look at me. When Peter stopped looking at him, he started sinking. And so the reason often we as Christians feel that we're drowning is that sometimes we're looking at others looking at him. Sometimes we're looking at other people looking at Jesus. Like, what does my pastor say about it? What do my spiritual mentors say about this? Instead of really focusing, and, and I mean, that's good. It's good to have spiritual mentors. It's good to have our pastor give us wisdom. That's, that's absolutely a truth. But we just have to keep shifting back and saying, God, where is my focus? Is my focus on you in this? Um, I'm going to say something that don't fight the storm that you're in. Because oftentimes God is trying to teach us in it. What if he's calling me to see his face in the situation? Saying, God, what, what are you saying to me in this? How do you want me to grow from this? What is the table that you're preparing in front of my enemies right now? Like all this stuff's happening. The fear is real. These things are happening. But what is it that you're saying to me in this, God? What do you want me to gain from this? And what if he's allowing us to go through, through the things that we're going through to bring us into our destiny that he's called us into? And without those things, we wouldn't be able to fulfill the destiny he had for us. So some of the greatest distractions in life we are going to face are fear and unbelief. We have to purpose in our hearts that we will lock eyes with Jesus. If we do not look at fear as our enemy, it will destroy us. It will keep us from what God has from us, or has for us. It will keep us from our promised lands, and it will keep us from our destiny. So it's not that we don't feel the emotion of fear; it's that I won't let it tell me what to do. Um, like I said, Peter was fear was still there for Peter, but he had to choose to focus on Jesus in order to be able to walk. So I just want to encourage us today to purpose in our hearts. I will not fear. I am not afraid of the future. I will not come out of this place that I am in until I refuse to fear or let it have its control over me. And I just wanted to, I I don't know, I was just praying about it, and I sense that God is saying that for some of you, something's holding on tight to you, and you don't, you just think that you can't lay it down. And it might be something that Jesus needs to deliver you of. You might need to be set free. Your part is to determine, I will not partner with fear any longer. I repent, Jesus, for serving it. And then you need to believe Jesus. Because he will do what he says. He sets us free. And so as a body, I just had some encouragement for all of us. Encouragement can be described as giving someone else your courage. And there are those of us, or there are those um, here today that have been set free of that. And God wants to multiply the victories he does in us. He wants to multiply those in other people. So God doesn't just deliver us for us. He delivers us to help others be set free. Um, Because Galatians 5.1 says, it's for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and don't let yourself be burdened again with the yoke of slavery. And so as we sing this next song, No Longer Slaves, I want you to sing it with the realization that we really are not slaves anymore. And like I said in the beginning, it's one thing to know something, but it's another to really know it. Because when you really know it, when you're in the midst of that really hard situation, that's your first thought is, I do not need to let this control me. That is victory. That's freedom. And it's for all of us. And so I just wanted to encourage us all in that. And I encourage us to declare this song over our hearts and our minds and our spirits. 
And those of us that God has set free, I just want you to, um, you know, if there's someone, if, if during the song, if you want to just come up and just, you know, just lay it down before God and just, you need that prayer. If those of you who have been set free of fear, if you feel like God has just moved on your heart to stand with others, that's part of being the body. It's like lifting each other's arms, lifting each other's hands. Um, and I just, I just felt like that was something that God had laid on my heart. And I just want to refer back to Psalms 139.17. How vast the sum his thoughts are for us. He cares so much for us. And the God of angel armies is on our side. As we sing this song, if you do sense that you need to just step forward and come up during the song. And if others may stand with you, that's fine. We're facing the Lord. We're asking the Lord for help. We're asking God to be able to interact with him in such a way that he will make us more focused on him than focused on the fears around us. Amen? So let's sing this together.
No two services are the same, and that's okay with us, because we trust the Holy Spirit orchestrates services at the right times in our lives. Would you say amen to that? We have some more testimonies, exhortations as God leads today, and some may spill out into future weeks, but we do have them. And you know what? That's what the Bible says, doesn't it? The Bible says when we come together, we all come ready, and yet we have to guide that and uh, do that the best that we can. I, I'm going to be reading a text from Matthew 17, uh, 1 through 21, and um, we could read this together. Uh, Nathaniel's pulling that up uh, in the New King James, but um, I'll say this as the scripture comes up just before we do that. Uh, this was a continuation I had, con I had intended initially to do four messages on these passages in Matthew, particularly as it related to the mountain Jesus was standing in front of, if you remember. And uh, so we're going to go back to that. Of course, there were a few weeks in between some things which I didn't anticipate uh, and others that uh, just God has his own way, so that's good. But I, wanna, I want to, just before we read this passage in Matthew 17, just remind you of two things. There were three points, actually, that I made, and that is this, that Christ is the rock on which his church is built. And we're not talking about a building. We're not talking about the physical building of the church, though every building needs a foundation. The spiritual church, the people who know God and the Bible prophesies will do exploits in God. Those people, we're built on Christ. Furthermore, it is Christ who builds the church. So if he uses me and he uses you and he uses all of us, he gets the glory. We don't. The greatest lesson we could learn from all of history is that what always topples any movement or any life is when we no longer focus on God, but we focus on ourselves. If we really think we're that great, God has a way to humble us. It's really God that's great. It's the Lord that we focus on. The point that we also made was that the ecclesia is the Greek word for church, and that church, the ecclesia, is the universal church. It's the church that God builds. It's every born-again believer, every Bible-believing church, no matter what the stripe, the label, or anything else on the, on the door, whatever the denomination is, it does not matter if it's formed on Christ, there's an ecclesia that God is building, a governmental church. The, the, the spiritual government means we come into order. We no longer think we're the center. We're willing to yield to others. We're willing to say, no, you go first. No, that's fine. 
We're not, we don't demand that we be heard at all times. We, we're under order. We're under government. We're under God. We are under His kingdom. And that ecclesia, a spiritual ecclesia, God is building and it will shift things on earth. And um, I'm going to speak this message, but I'm shortening the actual message because I want to give you an illustration of the message that we have just experienced. Yet many believers are unaware of what has just happened and is still happening. Yes, you hear about Afghanistan in the news, but what you're not hearing in the news is the phenomenal miracle of the ecclesia of God that has been manifested on earth on a tarmac surrounded by enemies. It's just occurred and still occurring. It's not done. And the stories will come out. But I felt there are a few things that need to be declared. And the ecclesia is critical, but the keys of the kingdom, which I just foreshadowed now, the keys of the kingdom, how does this kingdom come forth through believers? It comes forth from the inside out and the bottom up. It comes forth through each believer saying, not my will, but yours be done. We have that decision every moment of every day. Lord, it's not me, it's you. That's the key of the kingdom. That's the method. That's the way of the cross. It was the exact opposite. So if you bring up that PowerPoint, to Nathaniel, real quickly, and then we'll go just for a moment. I know I'm throwing curveballs again at the, at the balcony. You just don't see him up there smiling as I do it. <laughs> I just kind of, he's, he's fine. But when we talked about this in our previous messages, before we read the text, because it's important to get the context, this was the mountain, as it is today with Taurus. You see all the, the um, destruction, the former temples that were built to Pan, the Greek goddesses. It was the central place. It was the mouth of every evil spirit and false religion in ancient times. This, this mountain was considered the mouth of evil. The cave was considered the mouth of evil. People did not want to go there. They did not want to, to, to go. And so you remember when Jesus took them there, they, they, you can imagine the discussion along the way. You're taking us where? This is not a place any Jew would have gone to. And yet it was the source of the Jordan River. It was the source of the Jordan River. And all evil in the world that appears to be the source of all things and under control, let me just clue you in on what Jesus said. Jesus said, no, the enemy has usurped it. It's the Lord God that's the source of the river of healing. It's not the enemy. Yet the enemy has usurped it through sin. We know that's good. We live in a fallen world. People don't do the right thing. They don't make the right decisions. Leaders don't do the right thing and don't make the right decisions. Sin is universal. And so, and go ahead to the next slide just real quickly. We talked about the fact that um, with this aspect of the gates of hell, we looked at this fact that Jesus, when he said this on the mountain, or actually in front of the mountain, he spoke to his disciples, and he told them, I am the revelation. In fact, he recognized this when, when, when Peter was able to declare it. If you just go to the next couple of slides, I want to just give the context, then we'll go back to this. So he said he was the rock. You can see the mountain behind him. He's actually probably closer to the actual place where the deities are being worshipped. And he tells them this. Go ahead to the next one. And he said, though, in that first one, is the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. There are gates of hell. Now, he uses the Greek word Hades. That's different than, if you're thinking of the eternal place of hell and punishment, that's not what he's referring to. He's referring to the present structure and hold of evil in the earth today. There's a difference between the two. It's the holding of evil. It brings that terrible fear that we've been talking about upon us. Because it looks like, wouldn't you agree, if you just watch the news, you think evil is winning. But I've got good news. The gospel says no. Everything that's happening is not what you see. And that's what Jesus said. He went to the very place and he said, look, the keys of the kingdom. See, the Sanhedrin, the Jews of the day, simply said this, that when we make a decision and we decree it, the heaven listens to the Sanhedrin and does what we want. 
So the Jewish council said, you better fear us because when we make a decision about you, heaven agrees with us and God's coming against you. So people who were sick, people who had leprosy, people who had the area, they didn't just social distance for their healing, which is biblical. What they did do was they put them all in a cage in the corner and simply said, that's the place for you because the Sanhedrin added to what God said and said, you are not worthy to worship freely among us. And that's because when we say that, heaven agrees. Well, Jesus reversed it. He reversed it and he said, no, what you are to do is to decree what heaven has decreed. It comes from heaven to earth. We agree with what he said. Not my will, but yours be done. That's the keys of the kingdom. If you go to the next one quickly, um, uh, so the keys of the kingdom, a measure of heaven comes to earth through the way of the cross. When believers trade their will for his will in everyday decisions. Let me tell you, there are big things that happen, like we've been seeing on the news. Uh, well, we haven't been seeing all that's happened. And then there are little things. And remember, it's your decision in the little things that end up creating the big things. Amen? Now, so curveball, hold those slides. We'll get to back to this. If you go to Matthew 17, let's stand and we'll read the text. Because this happens immediately after Jesus talks about the keys of the kingdom and he exhorts um, Simon Peter and he exhorts the disciples. And now we come to Matthew 17. And he's still on this mountain. He's, he's in his sixth day of teaching on this very same mountain that we've been looking at geographically. And then he takes them up that mountain. So in John, in Matthew rather 17, let's read this. Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun. His clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, do not be afraid. When they had lifted their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Now as they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Jesus answered and said to them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah has come already, and they did not know him, but did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands. Keep in mind, he's seven days from the triumphal entry, going into Jerusalem. Then the disciples understood that he spoke to them of John the Baptist. Hang with us now. And when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son. He is an epileptic and suffers as severely, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless, perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, 
and it came out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? So Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief, for assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for that. Now, I'm not going to go verse by verse. I'm going to tell you the story and lift out some lessons. You can go back to those PowerPoint slides, you wonderfully creative and flexible technicians uh, up there. I'm glad I'm not one of them. So are you. There's a famous painting by an Italian artist uh, that was done in 1685 on the Transfiguration. And Giordano's Donano's uh, Transfiguration of Christ, you see Moses on your left with the Ten Commandments. You see Elijah coming on the right. Of course, those aren't actual photographs of those Old Testament people, just so you know. Uh, they were long dead, but this is a vision they're having, and it's actually in 3D because they're up there. And you see the disciples, Peter, James, and John. They aren't thrilled with what's happening initially because this is a revelation. It's something they had not expected when they went on top of the mountain. Now, I want you to just clue you in on something. At the bottom of that mountain is the cave. Now, there's a lot of things in um, geography that have been changed. For instance, the original place that this took place was at the foot of Mount Hermon on the very mountain which I'm telling you of. The tourist attraction for the Transfiguration of Christ, where they sell a lot of stuff, is now they've changed it. So over the years, they've changed it away from its original location. Now, as an historian and a tour guide, I look for those things. Now, but this is where he is. He's standing on top of the gates of hell. And he's transfigured. Now, the word transfigure simply means to be transformed. When the, when the Bible says this, that when you walk with God, the Bible says that you are transformed into his image. The longer you walk with God. And the Bible says in Romans 12 that when you get your mind renewed according to the word of God, you are transformed. It's the same Greek word. It means to be changed from the inside out, from the heart and the mind out. The way you think is the way you live. The way we, what is in our heart, if we are terrified in our mind, if we're convinced that something is true, even if it's not, how many of you know that some people are convinced certain things are true when they're really not, and all evidence to the contrary, because their mind holds this to be true. And so when the mind is renewed, when you look to the Word of God and its roots and your mind and you rehearse what God says about something, you change. Your perspective changes. Your attitude changes. All those things change when the Word of God is what informs you. And this is what the Bible says. You're changed from the inside out. So here Jesus was changed. He was already fulfilling the law and the prophets on the inside. Now out comes Moses, and in comes Moses, not out from him, but they come and you're able to see. A curtain is pulled back. Now here's a truth we have to recognize. The supernatural world of God does exist. We just don't always see it. And occasionally in the Bible and sometimes in people's experience, the curtain gets pulled back. And that's what happened. This is, this is amazing. They, they were shocked. This transformation. And yet the transformation had three things that made it very clear. If you go to the next slide, I just highlighted, it makes it a little easier for you. What does it mean if we get transformed into the image of Christ? Well, here are the three things that happen. This is what happens to us. Number one, it said his face shone. Do you know that the Bible says that when you become more and more like Christ, your face will portray God's glory? That simply means God's priorities. The way we interact with people. When people look at us, I don't mean our face is like a, a light bulb. You know, you know what I mean? That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about, I'm not selling a certain kind of makeup for the ladies and a certain, no, I don't, I don't do that. That's not the point. We're talking about 
through your eyes. You know when people look at people in your eyes, they can tell you're welcoming, you, you have something positive to say, you are confident, you, you, are, you, you recognize who's in control. That's all shown through your face. The face is the countenance of God. It's the, it portrays the glory of God. Um, Christians, it's not a matter of just imitating it. Some people say Christians need to practice looking in the mirror and smiling. So we're a sad lot sometimes. Well, you know what? That's okay, but imitation is not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about just practicing. How's that? No, I'm talking about the fact that when the glory of God begins to come, what's really in your heart comes forth. The face, but also the clothes. It says his clothes were, were, um, were a light. Well, do you know clothing in the Bible is a synonym for our character? When the Bible talks about modesty and clothing for believers, it's talking about the fact that our character will show forth who we really are. Character means you keep your word. Character means you show up on time. Character means we, uh, we deal with that. One, one teenager one time asked me in class, they said, well, how, do I, how can I witness to my boss? I'm trying to find a time to talk to him. I said, well, the first thing to do is if you want to witness to your boss, show up early, stay late, ask him how you can bless him, work, be the absolute best worker that that guy ever has had. I mean, that's unfortunately a novelty today. Sh sh show up. No, I, I would like a job, please. Yes. What would you like? Four weeks vacation, a raise every two weeks, and all the other benefits. And then uh, I do show up occasionally. Because after all, you owe me a living. No, no. That's bad character. Good character is, I'm here to bless you, and I'm going to make you successful. Can you imagine a 17-year-old going to the boss and saying, I'm gonna, whatever the job is, I'm, gonna make, I wanna, I'm here to bless you. I want to see that you make more money, and I want to see that you are blessed. As they carry the boss out on a stretcher. Out the, I mean, but what will happen is, when cuts come, when suffering comes, when the economy tanks, who's the last one fired? The one they can count on. Because character matters. God transforms our character. How are you going to know it? Your face is going to give it away that you've walked with Jesus. That's what it was in the early church. Second, your character is going to give it away. You, you don't even have to say the name of Jesus or who your boss is. When your character says it, they're going to ask you what's wrong with you. You say, well, actually, I've just been with Jesus. Oh, man, they're crazy. And someone's going to stop you. So they're, 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 cra they're crazy, but they're a good worker. They're crazy, but that's the most faithful person I've got. And therefore, it causes people to then say, what else is happening? But the third thing is, it fulfills the word. The law and the prophets are simply two parts of the word of God Jesus came to fulfill. The law, the standards of God, the righteousness, what's right, what's wrong. And the prophets mean, how does it apply to you right now? So it's God's standards for you right now. That's the word of God. That's how Jesus, this is what they saw when they came up on the mountain. They didn't understand it all at the time, but I want you to tell you that God says, he can transform you when your feet are in the gates of hell. You can be in the midst of the most evil culture around and you are not looking at the culture as much as you're looking at Jesus and you're being transformed. Your face can radiate. Folks, you, you have to take it, understand. There are Afghan believers and pastors who have chosen to stay. Some say they have your name and number. Oh, you've heard it. We left our equipment. We left our weaponry. We left our helicopters. We left all that for the Taliban. But we left the databases with open passwords, and they've got every person's name. The Taliban has written, we're coming for you, missionary, pastor. We're coming for you. Well, some of the pastors said, then come to me, you will find me doing the same thing I've been doing for the last 20 years. I am worshiping God, I'm looking at Jesus, and if God has told me to stay, and if the worst thing happens that I get martyred, I just simply see Jesus. There are pastors making that decision right now. There are others 
And they're not to be faulted at all. They said, I've got a family and I want out. And, and that's fine too. Of course. It should be able to leave. But people are making those decisions. It pales. My fear list is small when I think of theirs. And, and yet it's real. This is not fictitious. It's real. But a face-to-face -face relationship with God is the highest form of relationship you can have. The book of Psalms says this, Moses knew my ways. Israel only knew my acts. It means that Moses walked with God face to face. He's the only Old Testament prophet, the Bible says so in Deuteronomy 34, the only person that ever walked face to face with God till Christ came. Face to face meaning you have an intimate relationship with God where you, you don't mind talking with the Lord. Now we can do that through prayer. In the New Testament we have an intermediary, a, a, a mediator called Christ. Therefore, we can talk with God. We can walk with God in a face-to-face -face manner. That's what this is all about. Peter, James, and John, do you want to walk with me? If you walk with me, it won't matter that the mountain we're standing on is called the gates of hell. It won't matter because whether you live or die, whether God chooses for you to remain, overcome in that sense, or die, you still overcome. Because those pastors who stand, they overcome. We don't know what stories are going to come, but I guarantee you they're going to come. We're going to find out. God will show us the things that has happened and the places they've been. Now let me be very clear about this. This whole transfiguration seems to end with verse 11. All of a sudden, Jesus starts going down the mountain. And he says to them, tell no one about this vision. In other words, God does not need false reports. Let yourself be transformed and let the transformation be the publicity. Don't you have to then uh, declare it? Christians are always declaring themselves to be beyond where they are. In this case, if you're going to be transformed, let God transform you. You die to self. You say, not my will, Lord, be done in the little things, and the big things will speak for themselves. So don't go around thinking that this is just simply a declaration club. This is a lifestyle club. And he's telling the disciples, listen, it will do no good for you to at the bottom of the mountain to just say what you saw. Because already Peter James, Peter, it'd be Peter, speaks up and he just says, hey, you know, this is pretty cool. We're on top of the gates of hell. Let's build three, let's live here. You know what the implication is? For all of us, you have an experience with God, let's stay on the mountain. But Jesus took them down the mountain. He did not stay on top of the mountain. He took them down where the needs were. He took them down to a demoniac. He took them down to people who had no solution. Took them down to where the gates of hell were. Took them down where the other disciples were trying to minister and having no success. He took them down to failure. He took them down to everything that could go wrong. And he took them down with one memory. God will transform you so that you can overcome the gates of hell. Now let's go to the gates of hell and let's test how transformed we are. That's a fun statement, isn't it? You know, my basketball coach, when he finally got me to do things that I was not accustomed to doing, is I just played, you know, neighborhood basketball. And he said to me, he says, Jaylee, you have potential. I said, potential? What does that mean? <laughs> We're going to find out. Well, all those sprints and all that stuff, it was, it was amazing because he would, in practice, he would go over it with me and go over it with me. And I was in the place that he said, look, you've got to learn a hook shot because you're one of the smallest centers in the league. Now, I'm only 6'5". And the guys playing in college was 6'9", 7 feet tall. So he said, look, we're going we're gonna to get you to do a hook shot. Now, I never started a game anyway, so I didn't know what he was working with me for. But he said, let's do it. So I would do it. hundred hooks every afternoon, taking those hook shots. And then he said this. Now, of course, we were either behind by 20 or ahead by 20. But then he took me to the side on the bench, and he said this. Let's test what we've been practicing. I'll never forget it. He leaned over, looked at me on the bench. 
Sometimes bench warmers want to stay there. Because I had a group of people, especially early on playing basketball, I had a group of people in the stands that I called my white towel brigade. Because they would start singing my name to try to get me in the game <laughs> with these white towels. So now the coach comes over and says, we're going to test what you've been practicing. Fear came over me. I'm going to flunk in front of no one was at practice, but everybody's here. I should have stuck with hockey. I knew it. And so there it is. I got there, and of just the habit and the practice. I remember the seven-foot guy smiling at me, and I remember the way I was taught to do the hook, pulling my hand right over the tips of his fingers, and one of them went in. <laughs> and then the towel. Wow! You know, that was my little 30 seconds of fame. But the thing is, listen, folks, that's the way it is in the Christian life. Oh, I love you, Jesus. I'm becoming so much like you. The Holy Spirit said, did you hear that? <laughs> Let's test it. And that, that day, you're going to find somebody saying something to you that pulls your trigger. And you're, I'm transformed in the image of Christ, but I'm going to let you have it. I'll be nice tomorrow. No, it, this is what God does. He tests us. Now, let me tell you, down the mountain is the test. The purpose of the transfiguration was to get a revelation so that you would go down the mountain. When they got down there, you've, you've read it. We've, we've looked at it. Experience of a revelation is a door, not a goal. It's to get you there. What's the goal? You hear the Father. They heard God speak. They, crippled, they were crippled in fear when the Father spoke. The fear of God helps you overcome the fear in the world. I can imagine, I put myself in the place of pastors in the Afghan countryside under the control of the Taliban, and I've put them in my mind and said, Lord, what would, how would I handle this? What would I do? How would I face that knock on the door? The, the, what, 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 how would I do in that situation? And I realized, just like you, just like me, they're human beings just like we are, you need to know the face of God when you face evil. You need to know those things, and it's not easy. And it's not trite, it's not rhetoric, it's not simply a prayer that says you'll do that. I remember Corrie Ten Boom, when she asked her father, she said, how would I ever know with the Nazis come, we're hiding the Jews, how am I ever going to deal with this? And he said, when do I give you the ticket for your train ride? She goes, well, as I'm going on the train. Never forget... He said that God will give you the strength at that moment. Well, that's a great illustration for what we're talking about because this is what's happened and what has actually happened. Let's go to the next slide real quickly there, Nathaniel. Um, like Peter, the other three of them, the three inner circles, we're going to have confidence in God. Though it's unseen, we don't always see what God is doing, we have confidence God is working. Do you realize this? Right now, the headlines everywhere, evil is working. Evil is winning, evil has the goods, evil has the money, evil has the majority, they have the upper hand, they're taking advantage of every mistake that's been made, evil, evil. Now I'll tell you this right now, there's an unseen truth that we need to have confidence in, like Peter. He spoke, and sometimes he spoke crazy stuff, but he spoke. He was confident, he was bold. We need to say, though I don't see you, Lord, I know you're working more than evil is working. I can't give you the full testimony yet, but I can tell you, he's working. Like James, we sow little faith. You see, James knew about growth. James was a, a, a disciple that was very contemplative. Yes, he was called Sons of Thunder with his brother John, but the point is uh, that when they had the racing stripes down their camels you know, in their hometown, they were the ones who were ready to call down fire, but James was one that was very, very calculating, very, very much a planner. Well, James knows that Jesus said, little faith will move mountains. He didn't say that you can just move the little mountain. They might have thought, well, that's great. Let's get rid of this mountain right now. The mountain is anything that you face. And the mountain can be moved, and sometimes you're moved. God may leave the circumstance. 
See, that's the thing that's unseen. They said, oh, well, it, it failed. These so many people got martyred somewhere in the world. No, that's not failure. They stood. They won. They were unwilling to compromise. May God give us the grace for whatever we may face. But the critical thing is, like James, he knows that a little faith grows into great faith. What happens is some people say, I can't speak to mountains, then speak to seas. What do I have to give? There's something God has gifted you to do that may seem small to you, but you be willing to do it. You do the little things. What's in your hand? What do you have? Say, man, I don't do much. I just like to pray. That's not little. That's big. Or I, I like to write. Okay, fine. Or I'm willing to speak. That's fine too. God will use whatever your personality is. You don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to have all the money. You don't have to have that. You simply have to have what God gave you. And that's the personality he gave you. That's all it is. That's what James understood. So he typifies what Jesus was saying. But then there's, there's John. He's the passionate one. He's the one that loved Jesus. And Jesus said, this kind, this this kind of deliverance, now he's not just speaking of the boy, but he's speaking of the fact of this kind of deliverance to walk into the gates of hell, you cannot live at that spiritual level without prayer and fasting. Prayer is communion with God. You can't live at a spiritual level without communion with God. But we all don't hear God clearly. It gets muffled. You ever noticed if it gets staticky? You can't hear God well. That's when you turn up the heat. That's what fasting's all about. You can't fast 24 hours a day for a year. You'll see Jesus a lot earlier than <laughs> anyone else. No. Fasting is periodic. It can be habitual. God could lead you to fast one day a week for a long period of time. God could lead you to fast one meal a week. And specifically take that. Because fasting was enhancing our walk with God. That's what Jesus said. He said, when I'm gone, you will fast because you will need to draw near to me when it's not so easy to do so. So John has that, that, passionate, that passionate area. We need all of these things. We're transformed because uh, of those that, uh, of what God has done in our lives. Now let me just tell you very quickly. What I know today, I will know more in 24 hours, but what I know today, and I don't have the whole complete story, but you and I need to be encouraged that though on the news we saw the challenge to get so many people evacuated by a certain date out of Afghanistan, and we've seen the horrendous pictures and, and, and whatnot on the news, and individuals, and there's over 100,000 people that have been evacuated, but those individuals were, were named and identified and um, not all vetted, but some vetted by the United States government, and they were being released. That's all, that's all good. But the neglected people that were not on anybody's list were the women, the children, and the Afghan Christians that had converted from Islam to Christianity. They weren't on anybody's list. And the problem is, they radiated, however, the transformation of God. They had the character of sacrifice. They had the passion to fulfill His word. There are fathers who took their women and children to the various gates to try to get them onto planes. But there were no planes that would let them on. Even U.S. citizens and, and others, they were not vetted and to deal with that. In fact, the keys of the kingdom, the idea of putting down ego, not seeking any credit miraculously came. Now let me tell you this. The Bible says in a tiny verse in the book of Revelation, I have a, I'm going to preach a sermon on this one verse and it'll come up at some point. I can't tell you when because I thought I knew when I was going to preach this. Anyway, the point is, it's this. The bride has made herself ready. See, we don't think we're ready. And in a way, I can look at the body of Christ and say, oh Lord, you know, we need a hundred more years. We need a lot more. We, we've got problems. But it's not us that the Holy Spirit calls forth. It's Christ in us that the Holy Spirit calls forth. So here goes. This is what I know to at least have happened in part. Due to the fact that the U.S. military 
pulled out first military protocols, against military protocols, the United States military and other VIPs and U.S. officials. Those left behind and through the cracks, as I've said, women, children, and persecuted Christians. Not only did our helicopters and weaponry go, but of course all the lists. So as one Taliban message was said, we know where you are and we're coming for you. Well, Nadine uh, Manza, the chairwoman of the U.S. Commission of International Relations and Religious Freedom, told the Christian news outlet World Magazine, which you might know, quote, the Taliban's imposition of their harsh and strict interpretation of Sunni Islam in the areas that they have taken over poses a grave threat to all Afghans of differing interpretations and other faiths or beliefs. So about 10 days ago, Glenn Beck on his massive audience for his radio and television simply said this. He said, I want you to now do something unheard of. I'm asking you to give till it hurts to the Nazarene Fund, and I want you to do that. And he said the following. He quoted Proverbs 24, 11, Deliver those who are drawn toward death and hold back those stumbling to the slaughter. And he looked into the camera and he said, Your Afghan brothers and sisters in Christ are being drawn to the slaughter. They're being targeted. I ask you to do something that's never been quite done like this. What is this Nazarene Fund? Well, the Nazarene Fund was created about 10 or so years ago, and it says it's the, uh, that it, this is its mission. To, il to liberate the captive, free the enslaved, rescue, rebuild, and restore the lives of Christians and other persecuted religious and ethnic minorities wherever and whenever they are in need. Now, for the last 10 years, it's been one of the foremost organizations to actually drop behind enemy lines uh, SEAL team, uh, former Navy vets, and others that know how to deal with things not in spiritual warfare, in natural warfare. The best of the best. And they've been working for 10, 12 years with sex trafficking. And they've been going where, where people are held as slaves. Where they're held, and I won't even go close to what happens to them. They are held in those areas. So what? Their cries in the middle of nowhere. No one knows where I am. My parents don't know where I am. I've just been captured, and now I'm being held with this horrible torture. And then all of a sudden, a door is kicked in, and there are warriors. I'm telling you, these men are willing to die to free that one 12-year-old girl. And you don't hear about it. The news doesn't hear about it. But many get rescued. I've been close enough with some public officials that have been on some of these raids. They've gone to Baltimore. They've gone to Tampa. And even in Boston. And they've freed sex trafficking victims. And sometimes it's not just prayer. They have intercessors praying for them. But they hit the ground running. They know their perimeter. And they get in. And they get out. And in a matter of 10 minutes... They have three people they've rescued, and they're on their way. And if they get retaliation upon them, they know how to fight their way out of a crowd. It's these people that responded also to Glenn Beck's call. They weren't going to wait. They weren't going to stop. They dropped behind enemy lines. They had been doing this for a long time. The first miracle occurred that in three days, $22 million came into that fund. He found out that it cost $4,000 per person to charter an airplane, to land it on the tarmac, to get the clearance, to get them in in a small, very small runway surrounded by enemies, to get a pilot to do that. He's got all kinds of insurance. He's got all kinds of insurance on his plane, on everything else. You've got to get it, and you've got to vet everybody that's going to get on that airplane. And you've got to get the families, and you've got to find the families. How do you know who's going to get on the airplane? That's where these GIs who've been fighting for years know how to get that done. And they're connecting them on the tarmac. The private sector led by Christians. David Barton was one of them that was in there. Listen, folks, they donated. Ken Copeland heard about it, and Ken Copeland said, Go ahead, take my ministry airplane and go fly into there, into Afghanistan. Come on, praise God. That's what the body of Christ does. Not only that, other ministries that maybe never had worked together before rose to the occasion so that now there's nearly $30 million that has come in. They hired 20 airplanes and got more than 5,100 people that have been targeted for death, rescued, and back into another country. They had to find out where they could land since they weren't welcome here. I'll tell you this. Not only was that a blessing, 
We need to see this with spiritual eyes, folks. It's just a mirror. Oh, I understand. I understand that none of this was easy. I've been, I, I've been doing nothing. My wife knows. I've been nothing but reading everything I can get on this operation. I can tell you this, though. It's one glimpse of the ecclesia at all three levels. Prayer, the physical level, raising the funds, the real physical level, sending in the warriors, and not only getting it done, the report came back. All these ministries, I can't name them all, but you've got ministries that have been concerned about persecution for years. They all said, everyone laid down their ego. Everyone put their money where their mouth was. Nobody needs credit. Let the glory of God come forth. <laughs> to me, it's like a tiny down payment of what we're going to see. God allows darkness so that the light shines even brighter. One person said, but the body of Christ hasn't heard all this. I just shared this with a group of pastors uh, two days ago. And they said, what? What? How come we've never heard it? Don't worry about that. The, the news media is not going to portray the glory of God. Just, just, that's fine. That's fine. It's going to be portrayed in various ways. And the full story is going to come out. And you're going to hear things I can't even tell you because I don't know them yet. But I scour. I look everywhere I can in order to be able to find this. Look, it's not over. There are pastors who wanted to leave that couldn't. There are believers who tried to get there and were turned away. There are many left behind. But you and I need to recognize this. Our focus is not on the fear of the evil. But we can't make that a trite saying. That's easy to say for us in this nation, living where we live at the moment, because some of their fears are real fears. But it's simply to say this, folks, God is working even when you don't see him. And it needs to be declared, our God wins. The God of angel armies is the victor. He is the Lord of hosts. And even as we today, Hear testimonies of someone about to be baptized. That's the beginning. That's the first step. Now, some of them have been Christians for a while, and that's okay. But when you go down, you see, when someone goes down in the water, and then they come back up, we're going to be walking down to the lake in just a few minutes. We're going to go down there. And look, when that happens, that means they go down. They're just saying this, I want to live the Christian life by the way of the cross. Death and, we pull them up too. <laughs> Resurrection, okay? They go down, but they come right back up. Because it's resurrection life. It's living that way. That's what God wants to do. Amen. So Bob, why don't you go ahead. We'll, let's, let's hear these testimonies. Because this is the beginning, but it's not the end. Amen. Let's give the Lord one more clap offering for what he's been doing in the Middle East. Thank you, Lord. Before we have the, our uh, candidates who are going to be baptized today, I'd just like to ask Aaron... Come on up, give a quick uh, testimony. I, I hope I can get through this without crying. I love how our God is a God of details. He is in the intricate details. When we, I mean, we just know some of the details right now of what you're talking about, but he, is, he already knew what was going to happen. He knows what's happening, and he knows what will happen. And our job is to be aware of what he's, you know, as, as, as that little voice comes into our ears and says, okay, this is your job, go do this. Our job is to drop everything and do it, and that's easier said than done sometimes. And this past Monday, you know, it was the start of a busy work week. August has been a, you know, crazy month for a lot of us. Um, we're in the middle of trying to do all of our adoption paperwork again, trying to get ready for homeschool. Just anything that on the human level you could say, this is not the best day for you to pick. All of a sudden, I get this, you know, I sit down at my computer and I get this urgent call from someone that I knew 15 years ago when I was with Mercy Ships. Some of you know that I was with a group called Mercy Ships um, over in Africa for two years. And uh, there was a woman, uh, you know, the woman, the family was from New Hampshire. They were, you know, so when you're in Africa, New Hampshire's really close, so you get really close with each other. Um, but I haven't heard from them for, you know, 10 years probably. And they're, um, I had heard through the grapevine, I had met one of their sons at Soul Fest a couple years ago, and he 
had had a real rocky, um, you know, what, what they call it for MKs or missionary kids, re-entry period. When you've been overseas for a while and you come home, your kids are, you know, can sometimes struggle. They don't really know where they fit in. They're third culture kids. And, um, but I, I didn't really know about the rest of the family. So this woman called me last Monday and said, or this past Monday and said, are you anywhere near Barnstable? And I said, um, yeah, you know, with, within a half an hour or so. She said, my daughter's stranded with an 18-month-old. Her husband abandoned her this morning. Um, they, they don't live there. They live up in New Hampshire. But they had come down because I guess he works. It, it's a rocky relationship that she shouldn't have been in. He's 16 years older than her. But it's not, I mean, I'm married to somebody 16 years old. That's not the problem. But um, it's in this, I, I better say that before I get home. <laughs> But in this situation, it's not a good thing. She's 25, um, and it's just a bad situation. But he works for HVAC. They had called them down to the Cape um, because of what was supposed to be the big storm. And they were, as a lure, they were saying, bring your families. We'll put you up in a hotel. They can have a bunch of fun. And it didn't end up being a lot of that. And uh, she, she had this little 18-month-old. She hasn't been walking. It turns out she hasn't been walking with God for years, directly related to the reentry problems coming home from the mission field. I didn't know any of this, but um, I guess on Saturday she backed up her truck over the, you know, sometimes you have those little pins on the thing in the hotel on the ground, blew her back two tires. So now she's got an 18 month old, no vehicle, and um, can't go anywhere till Monday. So what happened on Monday, her husband said, See ya, you have to stand your, swore that all kinds of stuff, you're gonna have to stand in your own two feet. She's got a little baby in the middle of nowhere. So the woman's telling me all this, and then she starts crying and says she's not doing well emotionally. And so then you go, oh, how bad, you know. So then any thoughts, you know, until then I've been going, oh, today, God, you know, of all days, today. That's our human reaction sometimes. That's, any of us do that. And then I heard this still small voice, drop everything and go. And at that point, it just doesn't, you know, all the other stuff will get taken care of. So I didn't know, but God had been working behind the scenes because... I was supposed to be at a doctor's office that morning. I'm having a, a minor procedure this week, and it was a pre-op that I was supposed to be in. A couple of days before, um, the doctor's office called out of the blue and said, the surgeon decided to go on leave for a month. Like, who does that? <laughs> but, and I'm sure he had a legitimate reason, but I was, you know, bent, a little bit bent out of shape, trying to fit juggle schedules and stuff. So my Monday was wide open. Not only that, where did she get stranded? Barnstable, could have been anywhere. It was half an hour from my house. So this is the part that I love. God knew, I didn't know her story. I didn't know her hurts, legitimate hurts from being pulled out of an African culture, dumped into a public school, didn't know anybody, didn't know where she belonged. She ended up telling me when I was 15, I told my dad, don't talk about God anymore. This is the pain I've had to go through because if you're a mom's calling, I went through some of that when I came home from Africa, and I was a mature 20-something-year-old. It's really hard. It's, you can't explain it because people think it's like, oh, you went away to college. Isn't it the same feeling? It's nothing like that. Imagine, you know, young kids, and my husband went through some of that too. His parents had to come home from the mission field when he was a teenager. Just from, from the two of us, I had a real, real clear sense of what this girl had gone through that most people wouldn't. So this is God at work here. So I'm talking to her, and I just start crying in the car, and she's got the cutest little baby. And she's like, why are you crying? And I said, because God loves you that much that he had my doctor cancel the appointment so I could be here today, so I could speak into your life. And so she starts crying. The two of us are bawling, and that's God. That's how God orchestrates things. And now she's friended me on Facebook, and she's... You know, I know she's going to be following up. And her mother called me a couple hours later. So she spent the day at our house, you know, with her baby. And, uh, you know, I took her back that afternoon. But her mom called me and said, she can't believe God canceled your doctor's appointment. In her words, you know, something that on the human level we're bent out of shape with, you know. And she said, she said for the first time, she let me talk to her. And she said, Kara, God allowed Aaron to rescue you because he loves you that much. And that's our God. He goes after that one lost sheep, you know? And so I just, I just praise him. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. 
Do we, did we hear what the, what the Holy Spirit's saying? How many times in a day or a week do we look at each other and say, honey, only Jesus knows the pain they're going through. And then we look at, we were down at the waterfront yesterday looking at all these thousands of people and we went, only Jesus knows the pain each one of them are in or are touched by. I, I thank you for sharing that, Aaron, because we need to have our antennas up, our GPS tuned every single day because there are hundreds of people within our reach that if we just stop long enough to hear that small, still voice, we'll know that we know for such a time as this, we can be transformed into the image of Christ and so the light of Christ could shine out of us to that individual and they would know that the God of heaven loved them so much they operated all those things in her life to be the only one that could have spoken into that situation. And now I'd like to ask Carl if you would be so gracious as to come up. And Aaron. And Aaron. I'm glad Carl's wearing his hat. That way you recognize who Carl Tripp is, who I introduced. Nobody knows him without his hat, he tells me. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Oh, this is a wonderful time to be baptized today. And um, I did uh, share a story with the uh, pastor that, uh, you know, I was married for 36 years to the same person, but uh, because of uh, her getting you know, she became a little bit uh, ill and, and uh, decided to walk away from the marriage. But during that 36 years, God came down and united us as one. And that was an amazing feeling that when two people are brought into one person by God, it is an amazing feeling. And I tell you, I have to tell all the young people people that when that happens, it's an amazing feeling. But um, let's see. So of course, today, it's about love. And uh, what I've learned is that uh, what you say could bring you peace, okay, instead of unhappiness. And I know over the years, I mean, I've been in politics for quite a few years, and I have said the wrong thing. And, you know, it has uh, made me very sad, can't sleep at night, and so on. Um, but um, it's what I've learned, and um, this is what I've learned. And uh, I actually learned this uh, in one of the uh, classes that I went to on peace. But it says, always place God between you and the person you're speaking to. Okay, and this is at work, home, relationships, and everywhere you go. Love is everything. Matter of fact, it's the only reason why we are alive is because of love. And there's a great poet that had put a great video together on this, and it's on the internet. And it's, it's exactly what it says. The only reason we are alive is because of love. So this is coming from the Corinthians 16, 14. And it says, let all that you do be done in love. And thank you, God, for who's the maker of all living things for this baptism. Thank you. Amen. Carl and I were talking just before, uh, here, you can stay right up here, uh, but before this, that now, that oneness that he experienced in marriage, he's now learning to experience with Christ. Amen? Amen. Right. And, and uh, giving his heart to Christ. So just come on over here. Come on up here, Aaron. You can just sit there, Aaron, Carl, right over here for now. Yeah. Uh, and then, Aaron, go ahead. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Aaron. I know you guys have seen me around, but I haven't really taken the time to introduce myself to each and every one of you. So this is probably the best way to kill 100 birds with one stone. My name is Aaron. Very nice to meet all of you. If you see me walking around, don't be afraid to say hi. Um, so 
I have a history in the arts, and usually, like, I'm not nervous at all. Um, but I think, I think the flesh kind of knows that it's going to die today. Um, and that's kind of where the nervousness kind of comes from. Um, <clears throat> so, like most of you, I'm sure, uh, I was raised in the church. But the way that I was kind of raised in the church was very kind of works and, and law-based. And it wasn't really until I came to this church and met the people that I've met um, here and kind of just the mentorship that I received here that I learned that it's not necessarily all about just your works and it's not all about your law. It's about, like what Carl said, it's, it's uh, about love. Um, and everything comes, comes from the heart. Um, so I want to take a quick little detour really quick. And uh, so I have someone in the congregation that's recording what I'm saying right now for my family. My family lives in, in Florida. So I kind of just want to bring them kind of a part of this. But unfortunately, they don't really speak the best English. So you're going to have to kind of bear with me for 30 seconds while I acknowledge my family in Spanish. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so, um, uh, okay. <clears throat> Para todos escuchando mi voz, sorita. <laughs> Siempre me dijeron que me tenía que bautizar con una madera. Y. Era bien difícil para mí eh, a quien escuchar <laughs> un, un hombre o el Señor. So hoy día voy a leer un versículo que el Señor me enseñó ayer, <coughs> que me dio la, la, la verdad. Y es en uh, Mateo capítulo 28, versículo 18 a 20, que dice, Toda autoridad en el cielo y en la tierra me, me dieron. <coughs> Por eso andan y hagan discípulos de todas las naciones, baptizando en el nombre del Padre, del Hijo y en el nombre del Espíritu Santo, en enseñándoles y observándoles todas las cosas que le he mandado. Y por eso yo me voy a baptizar en ese nombre. And for you guys, just kind of, um, just curious, I was just kind of, um, pretty much just telling my parents what I kind of just told you guys right now. Uh, so <clears throat> I was also asked to kind of say a, a verse that I, that I lean on. Um, and this verse was very impactful for me because <clears throat> in my life before and in the person that I was before, um, I used to let so many reasons or so many things kind of take me away from that, that love of God. So, you know, I would always say to myself, well, you know, I'm, I'm such a sinner, and I've been, li I've been living in, you know, in sin and partaking in what that is for me. <clears throat> and I just never really would feel kind of like worthy, right? So I was like, why? Why me? And um, Romans chapter 837 really kind of sticks out to me, uh, or stuck out to me yesterday. And kind of previous before this verse and this chapter, um, Paul is essentially, he's questioning kind of like what, what can separate us, uh, us from, from God and from Jesus and from his love. So then he goes ahead and he answers his own question in Romans 8.37. And he says, yet in all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present <clears throat> nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So today that I'm taking this step, I just want to say thank you to everyone that made this possible. <laughs> all, the, uh, all the forgiveness in your hearts and all your acceptance of me, not really knowing anyone and still being here um so all, all glory be to god and it's not it's not me it's god through me Amen. hallelujah